Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the EU Live webinar Opportunities for and of Postdocs in Europe. My name is Marta Agostinho. I'm the coordinator of EU Life, the Alliance of Independent Research Institutes in Europe in the life sciences, and uh, we are really happy to have you here today um, to discuss what, are, what can we do about uh, careers in research in Europe. So we have uh, 450 registered participants today among researchers, policymakers, professionals in the interface of science, uh, coming uh, from all corners of Europe and also from all continents. So a very warm welcome to everybody. We hope this will be a good opportunity to bring together the scientific community and the policy to discuss this very important topic. We have an exciting but very busy schedule today. We will have four speakers setting the scene. Then we will have four flash talks to from our uh, EU Life Institute's alumni to inspire us on the diversity of careers in research. And then we will have an element of question and answers where we want to bring to our speakers the most popular questions that the audience wants to ask. So, and with me uh, joining uh, you in this welcome address, uh, it's my great pleasure to have uh, Luisa Enriques. Welcome, Luisa. Good afternoon. Luisa is uh, representing the Portuguese uh, presidency of the European Council, and she's the coordinator of the research and space in the Portuguese permanent representation in the European Union. It's really nice to have you here today. Thanks a lot for making room on a very busy Friday to be here. So could you briefly let us know, tell us why this topic is so important for Europe right now? Uh, thank you very much, Marta. Uh, and uh, for me, it's, uh, and for the Portuguese presidents, of course, it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you today. Um, so I'm representing here now and talking on behalf of the Portuguese presence on the part of the research. And uh, I'm going to talk to you um, about uh, our recently approved council conclusions. But before that, I want to thank you very much, Marta, for all the, for this initiative and for all the contacts that we have had during the preparation of the Portuguese presidency and during the Portuguese presidency uh, that was very fruitful and helpful uh, to organize our line of thinking. Uh, but as well, I want to thank you for organizing this workshop. It, this is a um, kind of closure event for us uh, because we are approaching the end of our presidency. 30th of June is our last day. And uh, this is maybe the last event I'm going to participate. I don't know, but probably uh, on this topic, uh, because the Portuguese presidency had selected a kind of non agenda topic in, in the terms of the policy agenda. And uh, I will explain it later. So uh, we have approved uh, during the Portuguese presidency council conclusions uh, on the deepening of the year and the, the main title says providing researchers with attractive and sustainable careers and working conditions and making brain circulation a reality. This top, the, the title of the council conclusions explain what is inside. That was our aim. And I really um, I would like to invite you to read the content uh, because it's publicly available. Uh, because uh, these council conclusions, as it is required by the treaty, are approved unanimously by all member states. And it was approved in the Competitiveness Council for Research, research the part of research, on the 28th of May. So, this is the policy orientation of the Council to the European Commission and the way we'll see how we should evolve and implement uh, a sustainable and attractive research careers for researchers. Um, maybe we have never, you have never heard about council conclusions uh, because I know that council is not such a visible 
body like the European Commission or the Parliament. So I would like just take a minute to explain you what are the Council conclusions. As you know, the Council is the decision-making body of the Union, sometimes in co-decision with the European Parliament. And uh, Council uses Council conclusion in two ways, either to uh, provide policy orientation in a given field without any initiative from the Commission, or it is a response of the Council to a communication of the European Commission. And this is the case. We are responding to the communication on the new European research area that the Commission presented uh, last September 2020. Uh, this is not surprisingly that Portuguese presidency took up this, this topic and maybe the Portuguese that the place I'm seeing, Anna, over there, it's a nice to see you, uh, is that um, human resources have always been in the agenda and research careers. Uh, and, and during uh, the last years, we have as well worked a lot on the brain circulation because the way the, 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 the flows were moving was not the best solution for having a, a wider uh, uh, European research area in order to build not just peaks of competence and excellence, but to spread excellence all over. And so we have been concerned about this. So it was not a surprise to anyone that Portuguese presidents took up the brain circulation that uh, Croatian presidency started to develop. And so we proposed some tools and some measures to be taken up by the member states, by the European Commission to make brain circulation a reality. And from the German presidents, which are our trio partners, so the council works in trio of 18 months presidency. So to give continuation, because the council is a flow. And uh, so we are part of this trio with Germany, Portugal, and then Slovenia, which will continue our work. And the renew of the European research area was, in fact, our overarching priority uh, for this trio. And for Portugal, as the European research area was created in 2000 in Lisbon, it was a great pleasure to 21 years after to make a kind of refreshing of, uh, of that um, topic. And so, well, I'm not going to detail what are the consequences. conclusions, I don't have time for that, but just to tell you that we did this flew a long period before the Portuguese presidency. We have been working with the stakeholders, with the universities, institutes, and we have been working in, in straight uh, cooperation with the European Commission. So in, in order to make this topic moving up into the policy agenda and uh, Leah that is going to talk to you afterwards and Cecilia as well, they will as well be partners, my partners, um, in, in this movement, because that's something that no one can do it by themselves and definitely are not the policymakers that can do it by, them, by themselves. So we need all to, to make this a reality. Uh, so, and, uh, and I really want to thank you all for that because we strongly believe that there is a need for a structural change. We need to move to a no holistic approach. Researcher is one person which has impact of many, many public policies and different, and if they move from different research systems and from different uh, career, um, institutions. So there was a need to have a career for a researcher independently of their movement across geographical areas or across sectors. And that was this holistic approach that we have taken moving a kind of breaking silos between the, the public policies, joining, uh, teaming up with employment policies, social security, uh, skills agenda, uh, because it's not up for the research policies to solve these issues of research careers only. It impacts, it has to be together with the other public policies. And I think we, the time is ripe for a change. And now it's up to you institutes, researchers, community, research communities, and to the European Commission, of course, Council can help, but it's more to you to implement what 
has been the policy orientations that the council has provided. And because the success of these is in your hands. And um, because otherwise, this council conclusions that uh, I would like to show you, if this is this kind of document, uh, is will be just an important document if it's implemented. Otherwise, we'll be picked up by kind of 10 years later, or maybe five years later, by a president that says, oh, since 2003, this is a topic that has been unsolved. Maybe it's time, Try. we are going to try it again. So please, don't do this. We are trying to solve an issue from 2003. And in this real, really, time is right for that. Last remark, I, I'm not going to take much more time for you, but this is a challenge for you as well. I'm getting more challenging even nowadays. Maybe it's the impact of six months of being presidency. Um, in the, if you read our constant conclusions, there is, there is, which are organized by paragraphs, there is a paragraph 41, which is an important one. And in this paragraphs, paragraph, the council invites the European Universities Initiative to be used to uh, be used as a suitable platform to test possible uh, models, fostering interoperability of research careers and explore the possibilities for joint recruitment and training and career development systems, accommodating both research and teaching aspects. So my challenge is what about the, the, the dimension of the institute, which have a parallel, but maybe sometimes different path in the approach to the careers. So um, I would like to ask you, your life or the institutes, maybe to mobilize yourself to be uh, complementary to the text that is going to happen with the European University Initiatives, I hope. And uh, so uh, it's to you, but as well to the European Commission that might go in to be speak after me um, to take up this challenge as well. So great pleasure. Sorry if I was too long and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Luisa. Um, uh, really good to hear about uh, the, the, the conclusions of the Council and to hear your, uh, you know, your, your, your uh, request to us to do our part to do to 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 go beyond having a, just a, a piece of paper uh, from the European Council and and do our part and uh, definitely this uh, this webinar is is definitely about that and thanks a lot also for highlighting the the important role of research institutes uh, in in the ecosystem. Um, so um, before we pass to our first speaker, I would just uh, like to, to give a couple of uh, practical information about the, the, the webinar. So this webinar is being recorded for, for everybody to know. And we would like to uh, enthusiasm the, the participants to place questions in our uh, question and answer box and vote for the ones you would like to do our speakers to, to reply for, so that in the, in, the, in the session of questions, we can select the most popular ones. And um, no, Luisa, you did not speak uh, too much. It was uh, just the time. Thanks a lot for doing that. And uh, this is my, my lead to the, to the speakers as well. So um, we are really, really thankful to all of our speakers for being here today. Uh, and since we are on a tight schedule, I hope you allow me to signal to you when we are uh, reaching the, the 10 minutes of the talk so that you can wrap up uh, comfortably. Okay, so now I would like to introduce uh, Rene Medema. Uh, hello, Rene. Rene, uh, Rene is the, the chair of U Life and he's the scientific director of the Netherlands Cancer Institute. And today he will bring the, the vision of research institutes and organizations regarding what do we have to do about research careers. Over Thank to you, you, Rene. Thank you, Marta. And uh, let me first try to share my screen here. And I hope that's working for you. I think so, right? Yes. Uh, yes, I see not. I see people nodding. So, so thank you, Marta. Thanks for the invitation. I think this is a very important topic um so i'm happy to spend some time uh, discussing this with all of you 
um, I'm going to give a directly a disclaimer. I don't have a direct answer to all of the problems we're facing in in career tracks, but I think we should get them because I think um, you know Europe is facing a number of societal challenges and I am convinced that we will need science to solve them. And that means we need attractive career paths for scientists and we're going to need scientists in all walks of life to be able to address the problems uh, correctly. So uh, that as an introduction, uh, very quickly, what is EU Life? Uh, EU Life is a consortium of uh, 15 research institutes across Europe um and um it uh it actually aims to become a voice in europe to share uh, best practices uh, so that we um come to uh you know to develop together uh to develop good career paths but also good scientific practices etc cetera, etc cetera. we 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 touch upon all kinds of different areas that are relevant to to research institutes so um, we share back to press best practices when it comes to delivering uh, impact to society, delivering impact to patients. Uh, for example, I come from the Netherlands Cancer Institute, so uh, our research is all about trying to get better cures for cancer patients, better quality of life. Um, at the same time, we try to deliver to industry because we, as a cancer institute, cannot do the whole path from discovery to uh, medical development, for example. So we, we set up ties with industry and our consortium of EU Life is actually quite successful in this. So since we were founded, there's more than 50 startups that were sprouted from the various research institutes that are affiliated to EU Life. Um, and in this, I mean, one very important aspect, which we're also discussing today, is we feel that we need to build a very strong ecosystem. I just told you that, you know, science is going to be very important for Europe to keep moving forward. Um, if I think of the cancer problem, right, and the number of people that we train in the medical, in the life sciences, and how much many people we would actually need to be able to solve the problem, I think it's essential that you know, we lay out clear career paths for people to be, to want to join that that workforce and, and want to join the, you know, want to be part of the solutions that we have to come up with. But the same goes for, you know, for climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Science is going to be a very important part of, you know, how well uh, Europe can move forward in the future. Um, so uh, as, a, as a consortium, of course, we also have ideas how we could best move forward. So we try to um, uh, establish agendas, uh, establish input into the agendas that uh, will set the stage for, for further development in, in, in research. Um, so now onto the topic of postdocs. Um, how important are postdocs to the scientific community? Well, I would say very important. Um, they are, um, they are a fifth of the total workforce of our life science institutes, of the, the life science institutes of EU life. And I think that's an understatement of the importance. I mean, that's already a big statement, right? Of the importance of, of postdocs to the progress that we can make. But I think it's an understatement because with post, postdocs are, you know, a very good way to, to pull in for an institute, to, to pull in new ideas, to pull in expertises that they may have built uh, up somewhere because postdocs, in fact, are the most mobile part of the scientific workforce, right? I mean, once people become PIs, they become, they're still mobile, but they'll be less mobile than postdocs. So, um, you know, to have a lot of mobility, to have a, have a lot of knowledge exchange, we have to invest in that particular part of our workforce. And we have to make sure that people want to choose for, uh, you know, becoming a postdoc as, as a step in their career. And part of that decision is, of course, very heavily influenced of, you know, the question, if I do become a postdoc, what's in it for me? What will be my life after? Uh, what will be my career options after I've taken that particular step? So we at EU Life have, have looked at this a little bit. Um, we've done some uh, evaluations and we've done uh, institutes in isolation. This is an evaluation from the VIB, that's the Flemish Institute of uh, Biotechnology. Um, uh, one of our uh, partners, 
And if you look at this, you see that about 50% of the people stay in academia uh, after their postdoc. Um, and of those 50%, about 10% actually st stops the work in the lab, so to speak. Uh, they will actually opt for an ac academic career in something uh, peripheral to that. So in, in terms of strategy, in terms of management, communications, tech transfer, um, the other 50% moves out to other sectors, uh, particularly to industry. Uh, but in fact, only, uh, uh, only about half of those will actually continue to do actual research. Many of those will actually work in industry at the interface of, of science, uh, of the interface of research and, and application. And then about 5% had actually moved to, to different sectors. And, and these numbers, I think they, they will change a little bit over the years, but by and large, I think they, they're also the same for the different uh, institutes. Uh, this is another analysis coming from another institute that, uh, in the EU Life Consortium, where um, we asked people that stayed in academia on the left and people that moved to industry what their positions were. And you can see from the word cloud, um, well, I guess you can see from the word cloud how well they did. Uh, I see director on there. I see uh, a head, a manager, manager. Um, so I would argue that, you know, uh, opting for a step as a postdoc is is opting for you know a good step in your career, whatever your final destination may be, um, and and we can discuss this. Uh, I'm I'm a very strong advocate of uh, of um, of of science as a fantastic uh, career option. Um, but uh, let's put this into context, right? Because it's not that this goes without a struggle, and I think this is an important topic to be discussing today. So. When postdoctoral researchers come to our institute, um, you, of course, you know, um, as institutes, as PIs, you, you recruit a postdoc because you hope that they are willing to work very hard for your, your group, uh, very hard for the institution. Um, we, as, as institutes, also provide feedback to the postdoc and say, well, if you come to our institute, we basically have a contract with you that, you know, for all the hard work that you do, um, in order to make our research go well, um, we provide you um, a, a stepping stone for your career, whether that be in ac academia or whether that be somewhere else, uh, we should be the employer that ensures that you can, um, you know, you can develop your career, whatever the option that you choose for. Um, yeah. Uh, in two minutes, we will be asking you to wrap up, okay? Sure. Um, but um, I think it also is important to, to point out, and this is a very important point, that there's tension between the vision of success, or I'd say the classical vision of success for somebody that opts for a career in academia um, between the PI and the postdoc, right? The PI will, will, would like to have papers, would like to have new project proposals granted, and therefore needs uh, a postdoc that's fully dedicated to the academic work uh, yet the postdoc may actually opt for a different career and may want to train soft skills, etc. So I think that's an important thing to instill on your workforce that postdocs should be allowed to, to train also for, for other career options. Um, so as research institute, we believe that it's very important to increase good career perspectives for all. If we want to attract the best postdocs, they will want to be looking at us, whether we are a good stepping stone for their career, again, whatever it may be, whether it is as a PI in academia or whether it is as a policymaker uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the European Parliament, uh, if you wish. So um, we have instated uh, ways by which we feel we can empower and stimulate postdoctoral researchers for a successful and fulfilling career. And um, we've actually uh, uh, written a paper on this, uh, five best practices for postdoc career support in the life sciences, uh, which you know, has aspects of, as if you work as a postdoc, how can we best support the postdoc in terms of, you know, for example, things like child support, uh, flexible working hours, um, but also, um, where can the postdoc go if, if you know, PhDs have committees, where can postdocs go? So we have 
postdoc deans or postdoc contacts where the postdocs can go for support. We have uh, we train key skills, key skills other than the, the purely academic skills, so communication skills, teaching skills, leadership skills, um, and we provide career support. Uh, job, consulting what what career options are there for me, but also organizing uh, get togethers with alumni that have gone to all different walks of life so that postdocs can inform themselves about alternative career options, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and most importantly, we promote uh, early independence and that's by giving postdocs uh, opportunities to apply for for grants, but also, by uh, putting them into uh, training programs where we um, where we have the discussion of how do you take control over your own career don't put your all your career options in the in the hands of your pi but take control over your own career so i think um I, i'm sorry i have to end here i have much more to say about this but i think the topics that we could uh, take up for discussion later uh, in the discussion session uh, does the current dynamic work for European research? I told you about the big challenges that we're facing. Does a single PI model versus team science model, how should we do this? I think are very important questions for us to, to resolve if we wanna if we wanna crack difficult problems like cancer. Um, what's a good definition and per perception of, of success? Is the only successful model a career in academia? I would argue, I would strongly argue no uh but it is still a thought that is very strong in academia um and i'd like to, to end here and uh, look forward to the discussion session thanks a lot renee and um, thank you so much for uh, for this introduction on uh, on on the vision of the research organization and for giving us a lot of food for thought already for the for the question and answer session uh, we will go uh, directly to the second speaker now, and it's uh, my great uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mustafa Shaurav. Uh, welcome, Mustafa. Thanks a lot for being here. It has been really nice to, to, to organize this with you and to have you uh, in our discussions in preparation of the workshop. And uh, Mustafa is the, the chair of the executive board of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. And uh, the floor is yours, uh, Mustafa. Thank you very much, Marta, for the invitation. Uh, and it was my pleasure and NCS pleasure to be here. Um, actually, I could jump right into to the discussion after the great presentation of Rene, because there are a lot of things I could uh, resemble, but a lot of things I could contradict. So I will I will come back to that in the in the discussion. So yeah, uh, thank you once again for the invitation. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Mostafa. I'm the chair of NCAA. Uh, what we would like to hear today or discuss today is basically who are the postdoc, what are the challenges and opportunities, and what role different stakeholder could play. Uh, but we would like to hear from the participants. So if you are here, uh, please go to Slido and use this code 252991. I hope that Martha or anyone uh, from the organization team, if you could play the uh, uh, put the code in the chat, that would be easier uh, for the attendee to participate. So we'd like to hear from you. Who are you? What are your challenges? So that we can discuss a bit more in the, in the discussion session. Now, very short um, introduction about NCAA. It's an international nonprofit association uh, who have ever benefited from the Mary Skorolska Curie Action Fellows or a fellowship over the last 20 years or so. Uh, what we do is basically we understand the challenges from the researchers through community engagement and different activities and communicate those challenges to the stakeholders, uh, it might be organizations, researchers, policymakers, and provide different opportunities for researchers. Uh, just to give you a very uh, short uh, intro, what we do, what are the areas uh, over, even during the year of COVID, our global chapters and uh, working group organized over 120 events, attracting over 6,000 participants uh, in last year, mainly topics in entrepreneurship, how to start your career in uh, academia or outside academia leadership. Or, or different activities. Uh, you can you can go and uh, browse our website. We also have like uh, some fun activities. For example, um, uh, Super Science Heroes book, uh, encouraging young children to take the science path or career path. 
Now let's come to the very basic, but very important or uh, at the same time, very tricky question, who are the postdocs? Well, we call that, uh, I mean, this definition actually varies uh, by, the, by the field you work on, by the country you are employed in. But uh, in general, we can say that uh, a postdoc is someone who is an expert scientist, conduct research or prepare or train next generation uh, researchers. But most importantly, this position is temporary. It's not a permanent, permanent position. So this is a clear uh, criteria which you need to keep in mind. So that means you need to think about what is next. Uh, I'd like to share one important survey what Nature did last year, and this is more relevant for, for biomedical uh, or probably you life because you could see that more than 52% believe that the postdocs are really important. But there are a lot of discussion about this definition, and and uh, one one person actually said that nobody know knows what postdocs are. So that means we actually have room for improvement. We have room where we can define the role of the postdocs. Because if you if you look at the difference between a PhD and as, assistant professor, uh, their role is much more defined. So here we all could work a bit more. Uh, now, when we are talking about the challenges, that these challenges are actually various. This is some are in the job when you are doing a postdoc opportunities. It may be mental health challenges. It may be funding challenges. It may be uh, different other challenges. But at the same time, you have challenges for the career prospects. So what's your, your opportunity? And, and when I mentioned already, uh, for the one who are in the biomedical sciences, they have uh, quite different opportunities. So we have asked the same question to our members in, in 2017 in a major survey. You could see that funding is, of course, the, the, the most important. But at the same time, the work-life balance, uh, the lack of uh, opportunities, even the B word like Brexit is, it was still there from, from 2017. Uh, so this, what we try to do over the years, we try to address these challenges and try to provide more opportunities uh, for our members. Another important um, part uh, of that survey or important question is this, I'd like to point out here, the, the, the first uh, row, which says researcher career outside higher education. Before starting PhD, a, a person thought that they will always end up in academia, but that number is reduced like uh, more than half uh, after, after their um, PhD or postdoc. One thing to keep in mind, I mean, though in probably this, the, the opportunities in postdocs may be different in the field basis, but there were really numerous survey by the EUA, by different uh, organization involved in the European science ecosystem, which uh, says that the number of postdocs who will end up in academia with a permanent position is literally between seven to 10%. So this, there are really multiple results, multiple surveys. So this is something you really need to keep in mind that, there, I mean, you can make a simple math that if you're in European countries, how many permanent position you will have and how many postdocs are coming out each year. And one of the reason people would like to go to academia uh, after postdoc is that they would like to do research, but that's not always the case. I mean, this is another uh, survey from the Times Higher Education where you see that the more you, I mean, postdocs are the one who do probably the most of the research, so that's why they would like to continue that. But if you'd like to continue research, academia is not only your option. Other than this result, um, uh, there was a survey from the Leroux League of European universities who uh, basically found out that there are 49% R&D jobs are actually in private sector. And only between, I, I forgot, uh, I thought that uh, it's between 30% which are in, in basically in academia or in public sector. So remember these numbers when you think about your opportunities. Uh, but because I think that there are a lot of postdocs who are here other than showing some survey results, I, I thought that it would be interesting for them to uh, show them what are the opportunities. I mean, probably you are somewhere here, you, ha you have done your PhD, you have done your postdoc. But before you think about your next step uh, or what are the opportunities, you need to think that you need to prepare yourself accordingly. Um, how do you do that? I mean, um, you first see what are the uh, sector you can, uh, you can get job or your next, uh, next step of transition. So this is a survey made by Uraxis, which basically pointed out the uh, 
really diverse employment sector for the postdoctoral researcher. It's it's around the I mean, you can go in in anywhere basically, research administration, uh, other than the traditional uh, industry or or uh, starting your own business policy or even uh, media. So the opportunities are are there. You just need to see where you what are your success factor and where you would like to go. And that's why I, I call it that you need to understand. So what do you want and what's your definition of success? Uh, basically this, this famous uh, quote from Simon uh, Sinek, the find your why, yeah? I mean, there are really multiple online tool, uh, personality survey test you could take. Uh, for example, one is the simple Ikigai. I mean, I could talk probably hours on that, but let's not go there. Martha will uh, stop me within some minute. And then there is another interesting project we did with a Belgian government uh, where we tried to find the expectation gap between employer and employee. This is still uh, available. You could do the survey. The link will be in the, in the slide uh, later on, which you will get uh, from the organizer. So really uh, go and see what you would like to do for uh, understand yourself and understand the definition of your success. And in the next step, prepared the skills. I mean, there are these nice transferable skills a graph from the Euro, Eurodoc. So it's, it's also pretty simple. Try to make a concrete plan, what you'd like to do now and where uh, you'd like to reach uh, in, in, in future. You could do a simple SWOT analysis or you could use the design thinking to map your career. MCAA provide a course in the LinkedIn learning. You could, you could take this course if you're interested how to really design thinking your career. Now, also, you need to find, I mean, when, when you prepare your skills, there would be someone uh, who needs to basically guide you through. So you need to have a mentor. And uh, that's why get a professional mentor, go to the, we also have the mentoring academy, which will be launching uh, next year, but also there are other professional mentoring services. And if- Safa? Yeah, to, I know. Be, yeah, <laughs> two minutes, please. Okay, yeah. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and then if you are, if you really end up in academia, please ensure that you also train the next generation researchers uh, accordingly. And especially when I'm in uh, MSCA with the DG uh, um, uh, IAC and MSCA unit, uh, MCAA uh, helped uh, publish this guideline on supervision. Please go there. It's really new and you would be interested to see uh, what are there for you and what are the guidelines you could supervise and what, are, what, what is your role. Uh, and then, of course, help stakeholders because uh, uh, you being here shows that you are really interested to develop your career and you are re really interested uh, to give your opinion and your uh, all the stakeholders, especially in, in European Commission, there is this uh, interesting project from the DG RTD on the knowledge ecosystem where the project asking your feedback, what are your challenges on survey on jobs and everything. So please uh, communicate and, and please uh, join the discussion. And if you're a policymaker, your job is pretty simple. Go and check our uh, website in this um, uh, sustainable declaration. So really provide more career management services. I mean, there are a lot of ways, a lot of discussion we could uh, come into in the, in, in the summary part. So uh, yeah, if you're a postdoc, just understand what you'd like to do and then uh, plan accordingly. With this, I'd like to thank you and also invite you some of the events uh, coming in and part of the Research and Innovation Days next week where MCA will take part and yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mustafa, for this uh, very comprehensive and very uh, uh, inspiring talk, because I mean, I, I could already start imagining a, a lot of questions I would like to ask you and a lot of, a lot of things we could do um, to further uh, to develop research careers. We now move to the, um, to the speakers that will bring us the, the vision of the policymakers. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Leah um, Karamali from the European Commission, head of the unit of uh, academic and research careers in the DGRTD. Leah, thank you so much to, for being with us here today. Uh, I, I know you also have a very, very busy schedule but we are really, really honored to have you here today and uh, to share with us uh, what, what is the European Commission, uh, the overarching uh, policy of the European research area and what is there for the careers of the researchers. So the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Marta. But first, I have the challenge to share my screen. Huh? I will try. Please bear with me. <laughs> so, um, yes. I, I would like to thank, um, first of all, the organizers of this. Uh, I, I can sense the enthusiasm uh, of a very engaging community, and I'm very glad. And so, good afternoon to everybody. I would like to thank uh, Luisa for her warm words, uh, which I would like to return for the excellent cooperation, and it is important to continue. And also I would like to thank Mustafa and uh, the previous speaker for setting the scene about the challenges and providing already some hints um, about solutions. So um, in my presentations today, I will not be uh, exhaustive. Uh, I will provide some examples of ongoing work. I would like to set the scene very briefly and then provide some examples of, uh, of ongoing work. So uh, first of all, very briefly, um, what is the problem we're trying to solve from a very macro political perspective? We're working towards the European society of the future. We want to deliver on the twin transitions and therefore we need to deliver on the right skill set in the market. And if you look at it from a people perspective, we want to make sure that we have we attract the right talent by offering excellent framework conditions to the talent, therefore to the people. And um, we also want to optimize the opportunities in the labor market for those people, for the talent. Um, um, and therefore, um, we are setting ourselves these very ambitious objectives. At the same time, we are faced with a reality, which is uh, the precariousness of research careers, which is not only for researchers, but however, it has its own specific characteristics. Um, we have lack of clear career paths, we have expectations versus reality when it comes to job offers and job reality. The previous speakers mentioned expectations for academic positions with respect to real job opportunities and how researchers are trained to this reality. So without being very exhaustive, uh, this is the, the broader uh, context. And of course, um, uh, indeed, the Commission made proposals about uh, the European research area. Um, however, the, 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 the policy context is evolving. And right now, as Luisa explained, the, the, the council conclusions that we have on research careers just adopted uh, very recently actually set the scene for uh, the ongoing work that we need to do. And we have been working hand in hand and actions are ongoing, but of course we, we will adapt them in this uh, in political context that we have now. And of course it cannot be delivered alone. We need the cooperation of different, uh, um, of different stakeholders. So let me give now uh, some examples of how um, this uh, can can uh, this implementation can work in practice. And as the previous speakers, nobody has all answers, but we're trying to con contribute to uh, to the process. It has to be seen like this. So um, we are working towards a European framework for research careers. And as Luisa explained, the most important challenge for researchers is probably linked to um, the broader labor market conditions. Um, uh, as researchers as high, are highly skilled workers in the, in the labor market, and therefore they are bound by uh, labor law and they're subject to conditions for social protection, um, be that um, uh, work-life balance, uh, social security pensions, um, which are all subject to a very diversified European landscape, and this is the European reality. Yeah? So this is a very, a very first important element. Uh, and here there are ongoing, there is ongoing work by the council in order to uh, improve, to have incremental improvement, improvements, taking into account, however, that we are subject to, um, to, the, to the work of individual member states. Another important element when it comes to labor law, and here is an area where we can work, we can act more, is linked to skills and training. And when we speak about skills and training, we speak about at least two important dimensions. One is linked with taxonomies and the right definitions, and the other one is linked to the training and reskilling of the uh, labor market. And I will come back to this. Another important building block is related to the specific characteristics of research, of research policy as such. And of course, a lot has been done in these 20 years of the European research area. And, uh, and here there is a uh, very important ongoing work that uh, uh, Cecilia will present more in detail uh, afterwards with regard to the evolution of the Charter and Code and how it can actually meet the current challenges. 
Um, and I will come back to that point as well. Uh, of course, synergies with the higher education sector are very important since the higher education delivers the skill set and also hosts the skill set uh, of the market for quite some time before it is delivered to the rest of the labor market, for example, for the 85% of the job opportunities. And uh, finally, um, the, um, there are aspects which are linked to um, uh, targeting not, not only the framework conditions and the broader uh, regulatory environment, let's say, but the actions targeted on researchers themselves um, when it comes to supporting brain circulation in the sector of mobility, um, training or career development. And here we have envisaged uh, two um, initiatives, one which is called um, ERA for You and another one which is the uh, so-called ERA Talent Platform. So with ERA for You, we want to deliver a new policy scheme that supports mobility. We are used to mobility um, uh, driven by funding programs. However, it is important that there is that there are also in, uh, arrangements in place so that the funding programs actually can optimize their results. And this is what we're looking. First of all, when it comes to access to excellence across Europe, level playing field, optimizing existing infrastructures and labs, which are not uh, properly used, um, but also promoting in the sector of mobility in the right way, as this represents the bulk of the labor market. Um, and the other important element is an observatory of the researcher flows in order to make sure that in order to base ourselves on evidence with respect to uh, what we do uh, in terms of policy measures. Uh, let me talk about skills. Um, 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 so as I was saying before that skills have the dimension of definitions and training. So we are in the process of participating in a major update of the European database of skills for which we have consulted member states and also researchers. And I'm grateful to Mustafa who referred to our uh, surveys uh, before through the knowledge ecosystem study where we consulted researchers extensively regarding these definitions. We hope that through this ongoing process, national taxonomies on uh, skills, occupations and professions definitions can be rightly updated and therefore we can have, first of all, uh, the, a better statistical monitoring from uh, a national statistical office, but most importantly, um, be able to have to, to help researchers benefit from um, employment measures um, as a recognized, uh, let's say, population sample. Um, for example, we know that one issue with researchers is uh, that they do not have employment conditions, the right employment conditions um, across different member states. Um, important, uh, another important element and example again of ongoing work is the ongoing work together with the Iraq task force, Cecilia will explain, um, and also supported through the council conclusions. We need a charter and code which goes beyond values and principles, which addresses the challenges of researchers Within academia, we need clearer career paths, we need recognition of career diversification, a more diversified research assessment. Outside academia, we need incentives for recruiting researchers in business or technology transfer for business creation, uh, skilling, and so on. Where do we address these questions? This is the ongoing policy discussion. Um, uh, of course, um, uh, as Luisa mentioned, we use the existing uh, projects with European universities are testbed to develop ideas for researchers, but we not limit ourselves there and we are happy to uh, include research institutes um, as, uh, in order to pilot new ideas. Um, a few words on Euraxis, which was also mentioned by Mustafa. Um, turning your access into an era talent platform is offering a service to uh, researchers. So first of all, there are some issues which are linked to the organization of the network and by more clearly defined uh, um, governance and distribution of tasks using transforming it into a capacity um, oriented uh, group. But however, when we speak about researchers, we want to adapt the service portfolio to the needs of the researchers and most importantly, transform the existing portal into a marketplace. And this will be um, will become a reality quite soon. We are in a continuous uh, discussion with the portal administrators. We want to give it social media features. We want to um, have more automated tools built in so that uh, researchers and employers 
uh, can can have a meeting place. Uh, the work for the observatory is ongoing um, through a knowledge ecosystem study. So we will design a scheme, um, including options on how we collect and monitor. And this and there will be a links uh, with the ERA uh, scoreboard. So we want to have an approach where there is an overarching monitoring of the implementation of ERA and additional more detailed data sets regarding researchers. Um, a very important element is linked to the recovery and resilience facility. I know this discussion is not about programs and nonetheless, um, there will be a very important significant injection of funds through the recovery and resilience facility. And we see from the analysis of the recovery and resilient plans that come in from member states that very significant funds are allocated to research and innovation and also to education. I think this is very good uh, news um, and I refer to higher education in particular um, for researchers. So expect to have um, more opportunities for research grants, scholarships and fellowships. Um, also targeting the twin transitions and then targeting the public science base um, with investments in human resources, including reforms and um, incentives for, um, for mobility, also investments in knowledge transfer uh, skills and including even infrastructures. These are some highlights. There is an ongoing analysis, but just uh, to give you a, an idea um, of the ongoing discussions, which will uh, should, uh, let's say, come into the market quite soon, um, at least in the second semester of this year. Um, so Last Sylvia, kind re uh, Leah, sorry, kind reminder for a, a wrap up, wrap up. possible. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. Very briefly, we have two ongoing studies that support us in implementing um, uh, these activities. Um, one which is about to finish and another one which is ongoing until uh, early next year. And um, we will plan a workshop uh, where we'll be discussing all these points early July. And um, many, um, you have probably been contacted for many surveys through a knowledge ecosystem study, and we thank you for your support. And I think this concludes my part. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Leah. It was, uh, it's really a challenge to put in such a small uh, nutshell all that the European Commission is developing right now. So uh, your uh, effort of uh, summarizing was really appreciated and uh, uh, let's hope that in the question and answers we can uh, further develop this and um, I pass now the word to Cecilia Cabello. Cecilia thanks a lot uh, for being with us here today. Cecilia will talk us about the charter and code for researcher and what is in there for us researchers and research organizations. Cecilia is the chair of the EDAC standing working group on human resources and mobility and uh, Cecilia will also tell us about what is this about. Okay, so there is a problem. There is a storm in Madrid and Cecilia is based in Madrid. So uh, right now I am told that Cecilia uh, connection fell. So maybe uh, we can, uh, we move to the, to the flash talks and we hope that Cecilia can join us uh, soon. Okay, so the flash talks, starting with the flash talks, I would like first to introduce my dear colleague, Cheryl Smith. Thank you, Cheryl, I didn't introduce you before and you already uh, here in the webinar. Cheryl is a member of the, the strategy group of ULIFE. Uh, she is head of the strategic development uh, unit at the Babraham Institute, Cambridge, UK. And she will be moderating this session. So all over to you. Thanks very much, Marta. Um, lovely to be here. So um, thank you to our four um, ULIFE alumni uh, flash talk speakers today. We have um, Tamako Asoko, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, who's the Associate Director Clinical of Clinical and Regulatory at Newton Biocapital. We also have Anna Godinho from Head of Education, Communications and Outreach from CERN, and um, Jonas Legouras, who's the Vice Head at the Department of Strategic Cooperations and Research Funding at the MDC in Germany, and Flor Stamm, who's the COO at uh, Flamingo Therapeutics. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. And we're really looking forward to um, hearing how you've taken your research experience into different sectors um, across the research ecosystem. Over to you, Tomoko. Thank you. So 
I'm from Japan. I moved to Finland for my PhD and I did my first postdoc at INBA in Vienna and my second postdoc at VIB in Ghent with the support of Marie Curie Fellowship that allowed this mobility. I joined VIB for its excellent research and the track record of creating successful uh, startup companies and there to enhance my employability as a postdoc I took a broad range of uh, soft skill courses offered at VIB in between my lab works. Um, towards the end of last year, I was contacted by somebody from the headquarters of VIB that I knew from my trainings regarding a job opportunity at a venture capital firm called Newton Bar Capital. So this firm's main office is in Brussels and it invests in spin-off companies from research institutes, mostly in uh, Europe and some in Japan. And they were looking for an experienced postdoc who is fluent in Japanese. So Newton Biocapital knew VIB as a, a good research center with a strong business platform. So uh, through their network, they contacted VIB to see if the Institute could act as a matchmaker. And I had my interviews with them and I started working there as an associate director from February of this year. Um, I was hired to be a liaison between scientists and investors as well as uh, establishing closer con connection to Japanese biotech scene. And my role currently there is to perform due diligence during deal sourcing, as well as monitor the scientific progresses of already invested companies. And I'm uh, gaining skills in finance and business aspects of startup uh, companies from the point of view of investors in line with the plan that uh, I will become a representative for Newton Biocapital in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so my name is um, Anna Gudinum and um, I did my PhD some time ago now. I finished in 1999 at King's College London in, um, in the UK. So I have a PhD in development in neurobiology. And then what you're seeing is on the slide is my uh, two, three year period as a postdoc. Um, still at King's College and then moving on to, um, to Portugal, the Gulbenkian Institute. And it was at the Gulbenkian Institute in 2003 that I moved definitively from research, I left the bench and moved into science communication. And since then, I've held several posts um, related to science communication, institutional communication at research institutes in, um, in Portugal, at the Gulbenkian Institute, but also in the, in the UK, in Edinburgh at the Institute for Stem Cell Research. I was Head of Communications at the Portuguese Funding Agency for Research um, for four years and, um, and, and now currently in Geneva, where I am Head of the Education Communications and Outreach Group. So since 2003, I have become a full-time uh, science communicator. Um, the trigger for moving, for leaving research, for leaving the bench and for moving into science communication really was um, during while, while I was writing my PhD thesis, um, I very I discovered there I very much enjoyed bringing different pieces together, whether it was the literature research, my results, bringing them together and writing them up as a story. And so it has been this this desire to tell stories about science in different formats, not only written but other formats that led me to, to try and to stay in the, um, in the career of science, of science communication. So I have another slide, if I may. So currently I am the, um, as I said, I'm at CERN, the, which is, CERN is a European laboratory for particle physics. So a different research field to, to, my, to my training and my, my academic training. Um, I had the, a group called Education, Communications and Outreach. And those, um, bars, those pillars there represent the six teams, if you like, within the group. And we cover everything from external and internal communications, the institutional communication, tutorial, website, social media, to then the more outreach and public engagement aspects of, uh, of communication, working with teachers, with students, and with the general public. Good afternoon to everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this webinar. I'm very excited to be here. I started my education in Greece at the University of Patras 
And after doing a bachelor in biology and a master in bioinformatics, I moved to Heidelberg, Germany to pursue my PhD at EMBL. Um, the major reason that I was accepted at uh, BA, BMBL, in my opinion, was the interdisciplinarity that I was bringing since I wanted to combine wet and dry lab. And EMBL was offering ex an excellent environment to achieve this. In the four years of the, my PhD in Heidelberg, I was exposed to science communication uh, and I was voluntarily working with the Department of Communications and Public Affairs. And I was giving numerous presentations to students, scientists, uh, school teachers, and the general public from all over Europe. At the time, I have to admit, I did not really comprehend how important this experience would be for my future career, but this exact experience showed me that there are other scientific ac activities outside uh, uh, the carrying out of research in the lab that the scientists can do. And that is a crucial work to be done. And on top of, of that, that there is a great need for researchers to engage in such activities. Um, could we go to the next slide? Uh, the, the science communication skills that I acquired at EMBL uh, opened the road to get my first job outside academia at the Center for Molecular Medicine in Vienna, in Austria, where I was working as scientific assistant to the director and scientific writer, gaining experience in grant writing. And this enabled me to get a position at the Max Delberg Center, where I'm still working. Uh, I started as an EU liaison officer, and uh, with time I got different positions as department head or head of international projects managing a team of up to 15 people and being responsible for uh, approximately 30 million euros um, in fund. I think we might have um, lost Jonas. Flora, are you there? I'm there, yeah. I, my connection is also not great, I think. Um, shall I just uh, take uh, over? Absolutely, Flora. That would be really helpful. We'd try and get Jonas back, but I think he was nearly, he was nearly done. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'm a Chief Operations Officer at Flamingo Therapeutics, which is a small, bio uh, a small uh, biotech company in uh, Leuven in Belgium. Uh, I started the company together with someone who had uh, started and ran companies before, uh, and we raised the funds together to uh, incorporate. Uh, we are a small company. We're currently um, uh, recruiting. So if you can find us on Jobsoit, uh, maybe that's an interesting uh, thing for you to look at. Um, basically, um, I started, I came here from uh, first Universiteit Universite Leiden, where I did my um, uh, pre-doctorate, then uh, the VU in Amsterdam, where I did a PhD in neurobiology, and then I went to the Salk Institute. And then I was asking myself, what is next? Because I had uh, decided that I did not want to pursue a career in, um, uh, as a, uh, a principal investigator. So if we go to the next slide, so the job that I found that I landed was a business development manager at VIB in Belgium. Uh, how did I land this job? I think what is really important is to make so sure that your CV stands out. So I could show that I had a proven interest in intellectual property law by doing by showing that I had done the coursework during my postdoc, which are all, all which I am also hearing from the other candidates here in the panel. Um, also, of course, the reputation of the Salk Institute really helps a lot because having a solid scientific background is, uh, is very good. Um, in the job interview, obviously, is an important part, but the, growing in a team when you have a particular, uh, when you are given a particular opportunity is very important, which means that um, under promising and over delivering and also being a real team player and giving credit to everyone around you who uh, contributed to a particular project is uh, hugely important. Um, so from that position as the business development manager at VIB, it's, a, it's an ideal position to look to see uh, many opportunities coming by. One of the opportunities was some intellectual property in the field of long known coding RNA and cancer that I was very intrigued in. And I managed to raise the funds to uh, start a company which is now up and running in Leuven. Um, and that's basically my story. Thank you so much, Flora. And um, thank you very much to all the flash speakers, particularly for um, jumping in and um, when we lost Cecilia. I think we have Cecilia back, is that right? Yes. Yes, we do. Excellent. Okay. Really lovely Sorry, to hear you. I have a really bad connection. And <laughs> in... Don't worry. 
Don't worry, thank you very much. So this is um, Cecilia Cabala from the um, ERAC Standing Working Group on Human Resources and Mobility. And she's gonna to talk to us about the Charter and Code for Researchers and its implications um, in the life of researchers and institutions. Over to you, Cecilia. Okay, thank you. Apologies for before, um, I guess that happens sometimes and you don't have <laughs> a Wi-Fi connection. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Charter and Code. And, um, and and a little bit about what what we do in a, in the group that we are that we that I chair, which is the EDAC Standing Group, a working group for human resources resources and mobility. Um, just a little background so you can understand. Uh, uh, I think Luis explained a little bit that the uh, obviously the European Council is one that uh, um, is the member state decision making body. Then there's a the European Commission. And underneath the European Council, there's a group of member states um, that, that form a committee called the European Research and Innovation Area Committee. And the committee is uh, responsible for uh, advising and looking over the different era priorities, which in the old uh, communication, it was these, uh, these six or seven, I guess you could say, having to do with more effective national resource systems, optional, optional transfer, transnational cooperation, research infrastructures, open labor market, gender, Open science, well, it's more about circulation of, of knowledge and international co cooperation. Then the EDAC committee, um, what it does, it, it, um, it meets uh, four times a year and it has subgroups. And those subgroups are the ones that are here below. And the way the subgroups work is they're the ones that monitor the specific priorities and try to bring together the, the learning and the policy areas of the different um, member states that form part of this, these standing working groups. So for example, priority three, which has to do with the open labor market is the group that, uh, that I chair, which is the standing working group for human resources and mobility. So what did we do? Well, we decided uh, the last year that we thought that there was um, some things that we had to address, not just in the focus and the vertical focus of our priority, but maybe more cross-cutting. And so the three standing working groups, the one that has to do with open science and the one that has to do with gender and the human resources decided to form what we called the tri Triangle Task Force. Now the Triangle Task Force set out um, in terms of reference to have to achieve two different goals. Uh, the first goal was the recommendations on to provide some recommendations on training, incentives, and evaluation for researchers with an open science and open innovation per, um, perspective, as well as a gender perspective. Because we thought there's a lot of things going on at the member state level with these issues, and we thought that it would be good to bring these together, bring this and, and produce a policy document in regards to it. And the second um, uh, goal that was set forth for the task force was to review and potentially update or make a proposal for the update of the charter and code, especially in the light of all this edit developments. So this was before the European Commission came out with their, com their uh, communication, but we still knew that things, things were changing. And so, um, just to remind you a little bit about the tap, about the charter and code itself, it was issued in 2005, so it's like more than 15 years old. And basically, it was it was um, a means to develop an attractive and open, sustainable, sustainable European labor market for researchers. So it was thinking about researchers, thinking about the researcher's career, and a lot of the things that Lisa said this morning uh, earlier on. Um, is, are still valid and that things were are there, they're on the, the agenda. And so the Charter Code tried to adjust this. But we, um, uh, in, in this context, they, they, they would, the, the folk was more specifically on open, transparent and internationally comparable selection and recruitment processes. It was the idea of mobility of researchers career. And it was also focused on the career development and the professional prospects for your researchers in general. Since then, there's been specific tools for the Charter and Code and how it's been uptaken and how it's been um, implemented within the European, um, European member states and associated countries. One way through the, the model grant agreement in Horizon 2020, which is still valid in the Horizon uh, Europe model grant agreement also, which says that those institutions that have adhered to the Charter and Code um, basically demonstrate that they have good professional recruitment and mobility uh, conditions for their researchers. And then more um, more ambitiously is the process of human resources and excellence researchers award and where the institutions um, set up a process to formally have a action, action plan that adheres to the, um, the principles of the charter and code. So what have we achieved? Well, there's many of institutions, uh, more than a thousand institutions have, have formally signed adherence. 
um, uh, more than 500 have been awarded the logo. It's called attention of different projects, especially with the idea of that maybe gender needs to be incorporated into the into the logo, into the charter and code. And, and, and in general, it's still the best effort article, like I said, with, within the Horizon Europe program. So this is what the charter and code looks at like right now. Basically, there's a set of principles that have to do with training and development. There's principles that have to do with working conditions and social security. There's principles that have to do with ethical and professional aspects. And there's principles that have to do with the recruitment and selection. So this is another way to envision the charter and code not so much as um, as what I said before, the charter and the code, but rather grouping the, the areas in, 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 the, in these different pillars. So a little bit more specifically, so you can understand what are we talking about when we talk about the charter and code? We're talking about that researchers have specific responsibilities and we have specific um, rights in within their research uh, career. And so these are the type of issues that, we're, that are addressed in the Charter and Code. The research freedom to be able to investigate what they want to do, but also accountability, good practice in the research, their relation with their supervisors, especially with the uh, pre-doc and post-doc uh, researchers, and, and, and basically a continuous professional development. That's, that's the focus of the Charter and Code with the perspective of the research. With respect to the institutions is very important because it provides the stability and permanence of employment. It, it makes uh, um, a general understanding for the framework for funding and salaries. It talks about the issues of gender balance within the committees. It talks about the valuation and appraisal concepts. So these are the things that the institution has to take into account. And in general, in that interface between the researchers and the institutions, there's a whole issue of recruitment. The idea of an open, efficient, or merit-based transparent recruitment process, how the selection committee should be set up, how the recognition of mobility should be set up, especially because in 2005, when this is set up, the how mobility was going on and organized was something that was very important to understand and to recognize. So this is what the Charter and Code is, it is today. And so what happens? Well, it's, it, it definitely is a good framework for, for European researchers, and it's set up a basis, and it's remained valid through all, through all these years. Um, although there's things that we need to think about a little bit more, maybe um, have more emphasis, for example, the skills and rewarding system, or how um, the, we can enhance intersector mobility, not just mobility within the universities and the research centers. And obviously, the ideas of open science has, have to be embedded in the, in, in the Charter and Code, gender equality, um, more than just gender balance, and synergies with the European education area and all the, the initiatives that have to do with, with universities. Elif, so what did the, the work? Sorry, okay. Celia, if I can just ask you to wrap up. I don't know whether this is for your phone. No problem, no problem. So the goals of the, 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 um, the, the task force is to basically review the charter and code. And so the preliminary results, and I can just say it right now, are these ones that you see here on the slide. The, we're going to group the pillars in a different manner where we have research and ethical values all grouped together. The issues that have to do with recruitment and selection, working conditions and professional aspects, and the talent development of research evaluation. So the idea is to um, keep the principles pretty much the way they are, but add a little bit more of a, a further dimension, especially taking in consideration the aspects I just said before. So uh, let's see, I think I got stuck. All right, so th basically that's what we wanted to do with the, with the task force is to review the charter and code and embed those principles that we think are important for the researchers right now, which have to do with open science, which have to do with research assessment and which has to do with gender. And um, we're right now at the stage we are, we're gonna do a um, stakeholder consultation and hopefully by the, at, at the end of the summer or the beginning in September have uh, the results to share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, really, really great to hear about the, the updates on the, on the Charter and Code. And um, so now we're going to go to a Q&A session. And we've got about 15 minutes. So we've had some really interesting questions coming in and um, uh, keep them coming. And I know some of them are actually also gonna be um, answered through the chat, so keep an eye on that as well. Um, but first of all, I'd just like to ask the question um, to both Renee and actually to Leah. Um, so someone's saying that they're, they're glad that, Renee, you talked about the single PI. So this is this idea, actually, that the lone genius is rewarded for research. And actually, as we all know, um, that research is very much a team effort and, and even increasingly a really, you know, a collaborative effort. And so 
you know, can you say a bit more on that? And I just wonder, Leah, whether you could, and, and others indeed, whether you can say a little bit about how we um, assess research, and this points to our next webinar, New Life webinar in the, in the autumn, about whether that model of staying at an organisation for four or five years and moving on, whether that really reinforces that lone genius model as opposed to recognising uh, the, whole, the whole team. Rene, do you want to comment on that in the first instance? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the first thing is that you know, I think I think it's good that we have a model that rewards lone geniuses because we need lone geniuses to to propel science forward. But I think it's also true that the model doesn't work for everything, right? I mean, I, I, a problem like cancer means that you know a lot of a lot of tumors have to be sequenced. Uh, there's a great workforce that we now waste because they the model doesn't allow them to to be doing that. So, so we as an institute are trying to see whether we can appoint associate scientists, associate staff to be able to do, to do those efforts. Um, but it means that, you know, we have to have institutional means to do that. that it's very difficult to get this funded through the classical funding, funding mechanisms, funding bodies. So, so um, I would argue that, you know, team science, we need two models, right? We need a model where you can, you can say, okay, this is a lone genus and, and, and we're going to put a lot of money on, on this. We're going we're gonna to bet on this person to be able to get the next breakthrough. But at the same time, we need a model and they cannot be mixed, I think. We need a model where we say, this is a team effort that needs to be done. Um, and this is the model to, to be actually be funding that, that team effort. Thanks, Renee. Leah, did you want to comment on that? Yes, thank you. Seen for the from the research assessment perspective, not the uh, the, the, the points already covered by Renee. So um, the uh, there is an, a very intensive ongoing uh, debate about the reform of research assessment. And this is triggered both by open science, but also from, from the need to have diversification of research careers within academia and outside academia. Within academia, there is an ongoing political discussion about the future of universities and taking a holistic approach to all university missions, um, research, innovation, um, education and also service to society. So if you take a look from that perspective, then of course you cannot only reward um, research results in a very narrow way. We need to take into account all these uh, different missions and create incentives through a more modernized assessment system. And likewise, as we were saying before, because the bulk of research careers are outside academia, it is important to build interoperability of research careers. And therefore, there has, we, uh, we need to build an assessment that actually takes account of equivalence outside academia and allows for diversification of careers and actually optimizing job opportunities in the market for, uh, for postdocs. So these are all subject or of, of ongoing discussion, which will be addressed, as you said, in your dedicated workshop, but it, that also occupy a lot of discussion today, the policy discussions in research careers and research assessment more generally. Thank you very much, um, Leah. Um, so, Mustafa, I just wanted to ask um, perhaps at you. So here we have, you know, heads of a research institute. We have um, policymakers who are often the or, and from the commission who are the purse string holders, and lots and lots of um, postdocs um, listening in. So I'm just wondering, um, touching on one of what Leah mentioned earlier about career stages, what do you think is the one thing that they could implement after today to facilitate that postdoc progression, both within and beyond academia? So whether it is, someone asked about whether it's possible to stay in academia, sort of almost as a jobbing postdoc, and, and whether we can think about a better career structure, is that the answer? Or what do you think is the one thing that people, that, that people can go away and do today? So the answer, first of all, thanks a lot for the question. The answer will depend on who is asking. If it's a postdoc, um, well, uh, everything is possible if you if you wish to, and there are process for that being in academic career or in outside career. But um, I would refer to what Leah said and also just link to uh, one of her, her comment uh, about the researcher career assessment, the current academic system, the way we measure, the way we, provide opportunities to the outside of uh, academic career is not perfect. It's far from perfect. Yeah? Uh, and we need to evaluate this, that what we are doing in terms of the research and career assessment, whether we are, we are having, the, having the same uh, assessment procedure. 
And uh, even there, what is the matrix? Because I'm mentioning it, I just saw the Slido right now. And in the Slido, there were the uh, biggest challenge. I asked what is the biggest challenge of the, of the researcher? They said the publication. And also in another question, where it, where it comes to this, the, the, the same publication, where, where they need help. So uh, just whoever wrote this, just remember that publication is only one part of your academic career. And don't go, to, I mean, I, I, I'm boldly saying that, don't, don't just go with the number, don't just go with the impact factor, just try to do something uh, quality, uh, which has the quality. And now coming back to your original question, what is the takeaway from, for me, the take, takeaway for the individual postdocs would be that, plan your career. I mean, Rene said it really nicely, and we had this outcome from the MSCA uh, conference also last year, especially postdocs, because wh while you were a PhD, your supervisor were helping you, but there is no one to help postdocs, literally no one. So you thought that someone will come and do something for you, but the fact is that no, it's your own career. So start making your career plan from now on, from today, think about it from today. So that would be my, my answer. Thank you very much, Mustafa. And hopefully, actually, you know, there, there will be a, um, a real challenge to research institutes and other research organisations to actually act as those brokers, like um, that facilitated uh, Tomoko's um, future career that we you know that that brought the her you know into into that new and exciting area. But um, the next question I had actually was for um, Cecilia. And recently hearing from it's a question from me actually. Recently hearing from a colleague speaking about her transition from a career in academia into a different sector. She said that she found it really hard to admit to herself and to the researchers around her that she was leaving academia. Uh, I don't know whether many listening might, might recognise that sentiment. And I wonder whether there, it is related to the narrative that we've been talking about, what success looks like. Renee was talking about this earlier. So what the success looks like after a PhD. So how can policy development and maybe what's happening around the charter and the code influence this narrative and broaden the definition of success so that there's equal levels of excitement when from PIs when their alumni announce their career steps, whether it's to go on, you know, the, whether it's to go on to either become a PI, whether the postdocs announce their next career steps, whether it's to go on to become a PI or whether it's to, to get involved in another sector. So, so what, what, what can policymakers do to influence that narrative and make us feel happier to, to tell you that, no, we're not choosing academia, we're going to do something else in society? <laughs> I, I fully support uh, the, your, your comment and, and your suggestion. I think that's very important. Um, I think Leah was mentioning before, it's the, it's the understanding of the researcher career that it can go beyond um, just the academia. And this is something that we're trying to promote. And this definition, this wider definition is something that is uh, being taken into account, which I think is very, very important. And that can be done obviously at the policy level, but also at the policy level, how researchers' careers are developed and recognized. So although the charter and code sets the basis of this, it's how it's uh, implemented within the different institutions and the different member states is very important. So obviously we do wanna promote the, uh, a wider understanding of researcher way beyond, like Mustafa said, the, 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 the publication or the high of impact factor. It, there's, this is science communication type of initiatives. We're talking about assessment um, uh, advice to the, to the parliament or to the, uh, the different bodies. There's a lot more things that can be done working in industry, obviously, to, as we also heard by the fast track, some of the people. So this is policy. What can do is help recognize these type of um, initiatives and these type of new professional careers within the research community, which we really, really welcome. And I think this is important. So this is something the commission is working on and working with the member states also. And so, uh, yes, this is something that we have to do. And it's not, it's not just about um, the academia. I fully, fully support your, your comment. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Um, there's a question for Anna and indeed the other um, flash, speaker, flash talk speakers. And it's saying that a common theme for postdoc career transition outside of academia is starting out or through the institute where they did their research. Are there suggestions to develop opportunities outside of that option? So how is it, so what can we do in order to understand what the sort of wider um, career options that are, are available? Have you got any suggestions um, on that? Uh, well, I think um, I think what Yuanda described as when uh, about specifically for wanting to to move explore the career in science communication, if there is a possibility to combine science communication on a, um, I, I 
I hesitate to use the word voluntary because hopefully it could be voluntary in the sense that you're not remunerated, you're not paid for it, but you don't have to do it in your free time. You can do it in normal working hours. Um, but if you can do that with your, with your research, that will certainly give you an understanding of, of the field. And it will also, it will also help for your, um, for your CV, you know, to, to build, if you build um, curriculum and I don't help you to identify who the key actors, who the key players are in the field to then move, um, to then move forward. In, in my specific case, I actually, when I finished my postdoc um, in London, I actually took time out. I, but I was fortunate I was able to, I stopped and I took time to reflect on what I wanted to do next. And I offered myself as a volunteer for a, um, a cancer research charity in, in London. And that's where I learned, I learned on the job. So now not everyone that's not available to everyone was, was for, for a few months. But if sometimes it is good to stop and just take stock of where you are and look at, um, look at the options. Thanks, Anad. Any other advice from um, the other short talk? I could uh, comment on that because uh, it was exactly like that, as Anna also mentioned, that you uh, engage in some new activities and actually talking at least from my experience in the beginning, it's not very clear what other options are there. What can I do in my institute that can enable some uh, advancement afterwards? Very often people think of a formal education and they say that I need to go and do a formal training. And this is of course one way, but very often we don't have enough communication within the departments, within the institutes to show what positions are there in science management, policy, strategy, science communication that uh, people can get exposed to while doing their PhD or postdoc or understand that these are very important elements in, in our institute. And I think this is something that we can definitely uh, promote more. So at least this information is flowing towards the research community and is understood as a core component of uh, a more holistic uh, science making. Um, Mustafa, I think you have your, you wanted to comment here. Yeah, uh, just a couple of points here about this. We also seen in the past couple of years in, in different international sessions, this topic comes out that uh, what, what Jonas just mentioned, researchers, especially PhDs and postdocs have actually no starting point where, what are the opportunities for them and where do they start? Uh, that's why MCA has a couple of recommendations and a couple of places, but we, encourage or we actually kindly ask the uh, institutes and organizations to put ample amount of uh, career management services yeah they really deploy career management services because if you look at the universities they have probably i mean i'm, I'm talking about really a generalistic or giving a generalistic number you have four to five thousand employee or researchers you need to have a career management services for them otherwise i mean th this should be somehow i mean encouraged and we talk about policymaker. I mean, looking at the what is happening with the era. Uh, I, I was also involved with this stakeholder consultation and Euraxis guideline. There are already enough uh, policy from the policymakers. There are Euraxis providing services, national contact points providing services. So it's up to the institutions to realize that and collaborate that and provide these opportunities. And um, I mean, here I need to say that. We even have the uh, adverse uh, examples where we saw, saw, uh, saw that the institutions are not encouraging uh, to the career development uh, services. So this is up to the institutions and it's great to see that uh, consortium like EU Life is, is probably an exception. And I hope that all the organization will realize that and, and provide this uh, um, service. Thanks, Mustafa. And certainly the, the challenge is laid down to you, Renee, and indeed all the other leaders of research organisations um, um, across Europe and beyond. Um, at that point, we've lots of really interesting questions left. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to answer them, uh, but I'm going to hand back, thank all our speakers and hand back to Marta. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Ariel. And uh, so it's time to close. And uh, on behalf of, of all the ULIFE uh, community, I would like uh, to thank you all for this uh, very good uh, discussion in, in this last uh, hour and a half. Uh, I also would like to, to say a big thank you to the organizing team behind the scenes, and especially Liv Ongina and Sophie Christensen, who, who really um, organized this with us. Uh, and a few take home messages, right? So there is a lot going on at the European Union, like Mustafa was uh, referring uh, very rightly so in the end. 
there's also a lot going on in research organizations. And as we saw, not only from Renee's talk, but also from the flash talks. Uh, and a lot of initiatives related to skills, employability, recognition, intersector mobility, success, academia and beyond academia. So now we just have to keep going and perhaps uh, increase the, the pace of, of change. There is growing recognition that success in scientifically based careers is a diverse definition. There is no single way to, success, to succeed. Uh, and there is an apparent tension between the needs of the society, the organizations and the researchers. But actually, as we heard today, I would say that this tension can be more apparent than, than real. Of course, there are challenges, like we said, uh, and one of the challenges is very much related to research assessment. So uh, all this discussion on research careers is super related to research assessment. And here, research institutes as agile organizations also have a, a privileged a position and also responsibility to promote change. Uh, and this is what we will be discussing in our next uh, EU Life uh, Policy Series webinar in the fall. So keep uh, attentive to our channels. And again, thanks a lot for all your participation and see you soon.